Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Let's Talk Automotive. This is episode 39, and in tonight's show, we have the latest and breaking news. We have a review of the BMW 128Ti, and our guest tonight is all the way from down under. His name is John Sinclair, an Australian automotive expert. And that, of course, means our game time is going to follow Australian rules or Aussie rules. And then we're going to have a look at our segment on how things work. And in tonight's segment, we're having a look at engine braking. And then we're going to end off with my favorite part of the evening, tap it of the week. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Let's Talk Automotive. So, Peter, you had a week off last week. What did you do last week, Thursday evening? I had copious amounts of beers, Farney. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, man. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what's well, news? Well, listen, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, have you paid your e-tolls? Are you up to date with your e-tolls? Um, yes. Oh, well, that's good for you. At least you build and relicense your vehicles. I can tell you the Fulun family is in big trouble <laughs> if they put in their rule that uh, we won't be able to license our vehicles if we're behind. Let's hope that sanity prevails there. I, I really hope so. Um, I think what we should do, Peter, is uh, actually just get the show going. Yep. And so, so let's get uh, into this week's news. So, uh, Mr. Phil Yoon, a couple of interesting news stories this week. The first story uh, that you shared with us was that Kia is having a, a recall. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh, it's about 380 odd thousand vehicles. And it is for a fire hazard that is a, a, as a result of electronics that have gone wrong in the hydraulic braking system, which is a bit of an awkward one. Um, but I've got to tell you, the, one that, the thing that makes me laugh about this is they're asking owners to please park outside. I, I just, <laughs> it, it boggles, it completely boggles my mind, to be quite honest. But in all fairness, it's probably something that is absolutely benign and, sure. you know, that everybody is overly safe at the moment. So it's not a bad thing. Sure. It's, good, it's a good excuse to take your vehicle to a dealership to have a free checkup. I agree. Okay, so the second story, this is where it's going to get interesting tonight, Mr. Fulhun, <laughs> because the second story is that Jeep is open to dropping the Cherokee name says the CEO of, uh, what's it called, Stel Stellantis. Stellantis. Stellantis, yes. Barney, I've got to say, I think uh, as a society, we are really starting to lose our minds. I mean, the Cherokee name has been around for 57 years. Connected to Jeep. It's connected to Jeep. So the yes. Jeep Cherokee has been around for 57 years. And this year, <laughs> some bright spark decided it was offensive. <laughs> So, so probably because lockdown was so long and everybody had lots of time on their hands. Well, I'll tell you what, I hope there's not another lockdown because there's a few other brands and names of vehicles that are potentially going to be affected. And, um, you know, let me give an example. Let, let's talk about the, the American attack helicopter, the, the Apache. The Apache. <laughs> huh? Can you imagine the Russians must be shaking in their kneecaps at the concept that they're now going to be attacked by the helicopter. <laughs> Huh? Not the <laughs> Apache helicopter. What about the Ford Mustang? I mean, we're going to offend horses now. Yes. <laughs> and the F-18 Hornet. <laughs> I don't want to get on the wrong side of Hornets. They sting like hell. But I mean, come on, guys. We, I think the corporates actually need to grow a pair and yeah. stand up to these loony people and yeah. say, no, nobody was offended by this for 57 years. It's not offensive. It is. Uh, it, it boggles my mind. <laughs> that's it really, that's it really my feeling does. on it. And I've got a message for the people that think it's offensive. Yes. Um, ba swallow a bag of cement and harden up. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if you're looking for sympathy? It's in the dictionary between? Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move on to the next story. And uh, this is an interesting one because I feel that we've got a little bit of a part to play here. So last week, <laughs> last week we, or not the week, two weeks ago, we had the, the Peugeot 2008 as a review. And, uh, you know, after that review, Pete, we phoned the guys up and said, listen, don't you guys think it's time for a, a change up in your logo? And Peugeot came to the party and they've, <laughs> revealed, their, <laughs> they've revealed their new logo. And I quite like it. I mean, at the end of the day, everybody seems to have changed their logo. So it doesn't surprise me that Peugeot have done it. Yeah. Um, I think that... 
unlike a lot of the other brands, some of their logos are have been changed for the sake of it and the designs are pretty meek and mild. Yeah. I quite like this new logo. I, agree. I know it's coming for a bit of criticism and some people have said it looks like a football club's logo <laughs> and all that nonsense. They're just yeah. jealous. Yeah. I think this logo, one of the things they've really got right on this logo is they've created a logo that's got longevity. Correct. It's, it takes a bit of time to grow on you, but that's a good thing. Yeah. And I, I like it. No, I like it too. All right, so that's uh, the news for tonight, Pete. And uh, I think what we should do now is move on to our next segment. Yeah, so in tonight's review, you and Vish once again had all the fun and you went and uh, participated in the launch of the new BMW 128Ti, which is quite controversial, I suppose, from a BMW point of view because it is a front-wheel drive vehicle. It's a, it's a front-wheel drive vehicle, yeah. But uh, nonetheless... Uh, They've come to the dark side. And of course, this segment is proudly brought to you by King Price Insurance. Now everyone's saying it. If you drive less, you pay less for car insurance. But how much less? A tad less. A smidge less. Around 20%-ish less. Or a whole lot less. Like 70% less for comprehensive car insurance. From South Africa's hottest pay-per-key insurer, Chili from King Price. We're big into less. Like 70% less. Visit kingprice.co.za for a quote. Hi, and welcome everybody to Let's Talk Automotive. Today we are here at X-Drive Park, BMW's amazing facility in Midrand, and we are here for the launch of the new 128Ti hatch. So let's go have a look at what it looks like. So we privileged to be joined by Ryan Wanasuria. That's good. That's good not bad, huh? <laughs> well, you're not related to the cricketer. I wish. Yeah, okay. I wish I had his skill. Yeah, yeah, okay, I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> but he's the one series product manager. And I thought, what better person to talk us through the difference between the models than the product expert? And I mean, let me ask the question. Yeah. We've got the one series, 118. Let's welcome ourselves to some semblance of work. And we've got the one M... M135i? M135i, yeah. which says, okay, I've arrived now, but I'm still working for somebody. Yeah. So now we present <laughs> the, the 128. 128Ti. 128Ti, yes. Yeah there's changes which you pointed out to us. So maybe yeah. I think better for us and our viewers is just talk sure. us through. We can see lots of red. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> I think that's kind of the, the major distinguishing factor between the 128Ti and the M135i yes. or the rest of the 1 Series product range. Uh, instantly, recognize, instantly recognizable side skirts in red. Um, if you, look, if you look at the side of the car, we have an exclusive 18-inch wheel, which you can only have on this vehicle, and M Sport brake calipers in red, also exclusive to this car only. That's very cool. I mean, I think it, it brings out its individuality. But let's talk a bit about the whole front-wheel drive thing. Yeah. Because now we've got BMW's entry into the hatch yeah. segment, right? Talk to us about the M front diff, because front-wheel and understeer can be a bit dramatic. Yeah, I mean, obviously the BMW moving from, uh, moving from rear wheel to uh, front wheel drive was a contentious thing, uh, but there were reasons behind it. And forget all the, the benefits of functional room inside the car, headroom and legroom. Let's talk about how the cars drive. We have two major technologies that help with understeer, which is synonymous with front wheel drive cars. The first being we have the ARB technology, which is taken directly out of an i3. It uh, stands for uh, actuator contig contiguous limited slip. Let's not say that three times Okay, fast. yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but what it does is it desensitizes the understeer so the, the driver actually doesn't feel it and actually pushes the car through the corner even quicker. So hence, there's no feeling of understeer. So, I mean, obviously we will drive it with Fani yeah. um, as well to feel it, but that's, I think, is a big shift because, yeah. I mean, traditional front-wheel drive now, again, I'm coming back to the hot hatch segment, you want to create individuality. And I think BMW's done it well. I, I think when you look at the front of the car, it's important to note that it looks very similar to M135i, but the air inlets in the front obviously have the, the, sides in, in, uh, the side skirts in red. And the most important thing is that the, the front grille is in high gloss black. Now, this is something optional you can get on the M135, but does come at a cost. So when you look at the M135 and you look at a 128i and you even take a 118i with M Sport, they're instantly distinguishable from the front or the side. And that's what we wanted, a unique character for the 128i. Yes, you want identity. Yes. Um, before we, we, we go, um, also I noticed the black tips. Yes. For the exhaust. Yes. Is that also part of the identity? It's standard for this car. It comes with the high gloss black surrounds, which affect obviously the window surrounds, the front grille, and the back. Yes. So, Ryan, obviously there's changes with this model being unique by its representation. Immediately obvious is the red interior. 
Are there other changes that would be also visible within this range? Yeah, so obviously to match the character of the outer of the car that filters into the inside, you see the red stitching in, in abundance. Uh, I love the touch on the front, uh, the front armrest. Uh, both obviously the rear seats and the front seats also have the red stitching. But what's important to note is that the interior has been updated uh, to model uh, a new 3 Series. And by design, you can see that it creates a more premium interior for the driver. Yeah, because because the, it, the the older three series, it's it's kind of old tech now. It's becoming like a bit outdated. Yes, and people are noticing it. So I think that's a good move. Yeah, and from I think BMW and side. I think for this to be the entry level into the brand, being the wine series, uh, it's quite a statement that we're making that you have navigation as standard, and you get to sit in such a plush uh, cockpit. Yes, no, awesome. Yeah. So Vishnu, thank you very much for bringing me along to the launch of the new BMW One Two Eight Ti. Um, your initial thoughts when you get into the car. This is an interesting market, um, I must say. In, in many ways, one would think that a lot of the cars have moved away from front-wheel drive. And I mean, we had the technical expert explain all the technologies yeah. around it. For me, I just find it an interesting segment. The One Series is not the car is a, not a go-to car for me. Yeah. So if you've got a 118 and a 1M235i, and this is in between, my question is what market are we trying to appeal to so my my impression is it's a really good looking car yeah. and you can always see they've taken a lot of intricate work you know yes. they've taken their time but what segment i'm just i'm asking the question well from from the the notes they gave us and and what they said was uh, they're trying to enter this hot hatch uh segment so uh, so that's where they're trying to play and you know if that's the case then yes they're probably getting it right with this with this model yeah, and so so let me let me ask the other question to this is that all right? So the hot hatch market has the GTI, mm -hmm. which if we look at the list price of this at six eighty seven is much more. Yeah, um, I don't know the stats on the GTI, so I'm, yes. I'm not gonna. We've got the A class, the A thirty five AMG, and the A forty five AMG, which is much more pricey wise, yes. but also performance wise, they much quicker. Yeah, so there's that gap. I, I want to touch on the TI because this badge hasn't been on, on a lot of BMWs. Um, <laughs> you know, to be quite honest, the two models that, that, they've, that they've referenced to, the 2002, which was, uh, I think, around about uh, 1968 to 70, and the 325 TI, TI, which was 97 to 2000, thereabouts. And then obviously this this heritage. So what does the TI stand for? It's a Turismo International. International. Yes. Yeah. So a sporty um, yet comfortable type of vehicle. That's what the TI stands for. So Vish, uh, I'm behind the wheel now. My initial thoughts are simply very sporty again, like all the BMW models we've had the privilege of, uh, you know, driving and and reviewing. Um, very responsive steering, very responsive uh, engine. Uh, I'm, I'm having a ball. Let's talk about uh, curb weight. Yes. On, on this model versus the 135. Which is an X-Drive, but it is a four-wheel drive, so this yes. is lighter. Yes. So it's more responsive overall. I think the curb weight from a quick handling point of view might be an interesting challenge to see between the two, which what handles or feels better. Yeah. With the front-wheel drive, you've got far more direct feedback all the time Correct. and you don't have a lot of electronics intervening where you'll do across all the access. Yeah. Well, this is 80 kilograms lighter. Yeah. Um, and front wheel drive, obviously that makes a huge difference with, with feel. With, yeah, with feedback. And, and coming, why are we talking about weight? <laughs> well, okay, Vish, I'm on a serious diet, bro. I'm okay. losing weight, but let's talk about the funny fit. <laughs> yeah, so how are you feeling? Is it is it chomping into your donut stream? It, <laughs> the bucket seats are definitely, you know, firm. They are firm. <laughs> they are chowing into my sides, yeah. Um, especially going around the corners and you know the normal stuff. Yeah, but like we said, this this segment, this market that we're looking at is uh, young, upcoming, young, upcoming. Just started uh, earning, or they've earning for like three or four years. So it's postgraduate. Yeah. So someone's got a basic degree. Now they're doing their honors. They've got a better salary Great. scale. They can upgrade from a one on eight. Is it is it good enough to to fulfill that gap? It's individualized, as Ryan pointed out. So there's an identity sure. which which relates to it. What do you think? Can I give you my honest opinion? I think that it's too close together. I, I, I'm not 100% sure. I understand that um, the hot hatch 
competing against other brands. Yes, mm. I understand that. But but this between the 118 and the 135, it, your, which is what I asked earlier, was okay, it's cute, but does it present you with a cigar? Mm. Yeah, it's it's a difficult one. I think mm. we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. Yeah, from a from a market and sales point of view. Yeah. Before we get to final thoughts, I want to just run through the setup in here. Um, obviously, very very much the BMW DNA. Everything's where we expect it to be. It's got all the bells and whistles, the touchscreen yes, navigation the and the iDrive stuff. Very nice digital display here in front of us. So I'm, I'm very comfortable in that sense and thinking that this is, you know, if you, if you think about the fact that this is the sort of the entry level BMW, that's, that's nice to know and nice to see. Yes, and also I think what we've seen through all the models, I mean, going all the way back to the 8 series, all the, all the vehicles we've driven and tested, um, BMW's regularity for yes. all the models means that if you are a family person with multiple BMWs, it's very easy to fit yeah. from one car to the next with minimal fuss. And right. I think that's always, and I mean, a lot of people have said it's, it's too clinical, it's too neutral, but I think that it it does have a place yes. because you, you can distinguish the various models sure. um, in there. Okay, so coming back to final thoughts, Vish, um, I'm definitely impressed. Uh, I can't say that I'm not impressed. Very, very much performance vehicle. Um, doing all what it's supposed to do, ticking all the boxes. Um, so we probably need to give this a rating now out of out of 10 in the segment, which is the hot hatch segment. Yes. So give me your give me your rate. I, I just need to take a pause before we rate. And, and, and it's a question we've been talking about is, Again, where does it fit? For me, I'm, I'm very unclear about it. Um, I find the difference between the top rated, uh, the high spec and the low spec model and this is kind of, it's not enough to justify another model. Yeah. Um, so, so I would, in its hot hatch segment, in the price rating, it would rate high. Yeah. The performance rating in hot hatch, it rates low. Yeah. So I, I'd go for a sort of a 6.5 out of 10 for me. Yeah. With those, um, well, we're very close. Yeah. Um, I was definitely going to go for a seven out of ten, um, just just for that exact same. You know, if we go, was it the the Mercedes A35 that we yes that we had also for a review not too long ago? Um, when we look at performance, that blew my mind. Yes. Um, but if you if you think about, let's take another example. What what other hot hatch can we compare it to at, at a bit of a lower uh, uh, at a lower spec? Uh, I don't the, know. The, I mean, the, the Renault Megane and, and the and the VWs and the, G, yeah, and the VWs, the, the GTIs. Yeah. So there, there again, that that rates higher. So I'm going to give it a seven out of ten. Awesome. And that's it for Let's Talk Automotive and our review on the BMW 128Ti. And we'll see you again next week. Bye. Uh, so that review proudly brought to you by King Price Insurance and uh, please guys if you're looking to give your insurance the royal treatment just uh, SMS King to what was it three three one four five two and uh, the guys will sort you out. Yeah, so I mean, I don't, I don't know if you uh, have an objection to me maybe chipping in a little bit and commenting you're more than on, welcome. on give that. more than welcome. Give me your thoughts. But I think you guys were maybe a little bit harsh on your ratings. Really? Yeah, and, and the reason why I say that is, is twofold. First of all, from a performance point of view, you guys were comparing it to vehicles that cost nearly double its price That's for a the fair, same segment. Fair okay. point. And the second is, let's look at what its actual direct competitors are. So we're looking at um, the Golf GTI. Yeah. It's, it's a smidgen cheaper than the current Golf 7 GTI. And remember, the Golf 8's coming in, and there's always sure. going to be a price increase yeah, on yeah. that. And it's considerably cheaper than the Honda Type R, believe it or sure. not. So in that context, uh, I, I think the, the, the car deserves a bit more of a score. And, I got to, and I'll end off in saying this. I've always been very critical of BMW's design philosophy. Yes. But of late, I've got to say they have really turned up the, the, the pressure in terms of making sure that the cars are absolutely beautifully designed. Yeah. And this car looks the part. I absolutely love it. Awesome. 
Well, there you guys have it. Professor Peter just uh, chipping in, tell us, telling us that we're wrong again, but uh, we, we're getting used to that. It's only because I don't get invited <laughs> to these lectures. <laughs> All right, guys, it's time for uh, this week's guest. All the way from down under, John Sinclair, automotive expert in Australia. Thank you very much for joining us, John. Uh, great to be on the show. Thanks very much for inviting me. So it's, it's good to talk to you. Be before we do anything else, I want the viewers to understand that it is now 20 minutes past three in the morning, John. So thank you very much for staying up or, or waking up early. I don't know what you did. <laughs> yeah, so it's an early wake up. So it's, it's nothing a good coffee can solve. So it's all good. <laughs> thank you so much, John. Awesome. I, I think, John, um, before we kick off with, with uh, our session with you guys, I just wanted to maybe throw it out to the viewers that one of the things that we're going to be discussing is whether car prices in South Africa are more expensive relative to vehicles in Australia. So we've picked three models just as a, as a random sort of example. And what I'd like the viewers to perhaps do is just tell us whether they think each of these models is going to be more expensive or cheaper in Australia. So the first... We're so going to quickly show you the three. So the first one is the Toyota Yaris, and it's the baseline. Yeah. So in Australia, it's called the Ascent, and in South Africa, it's the 1.5 Xi. That, that's a picture of the hybrid, but don't stress. And then we've got the, the Audi Q3, and I don't know how to say this, the 40 TSI S, TFSR S-Tronic S-Line. And then we have the third vehicle is the C43 AMG. So those are the three cars. Put your thoughts into the comments in terms of what you think is going to be the difference between the pricing between South Africa and Australia. But before we get there, John, maybe let's just kick off with a, a little bit of a background about, about you in the motor industry, because you do have an extensive experience and career in the motor industry. And of particular interest for us is, of course, your time spent in Europe, where you launched some EVs into, into some of the markets there. Yeah, Peter, I've been in automotive for around 30 years. Uh, spent a lot of time in South Africa in automotive, mainly on the OEM side, so not so much on the dealer side. And then I spent about six to seven years up in the Nordics, uh, looking after Nordics and Baltic countries, where I worked for Nissan. Uh, we set up a sales distribution company. But as part of that role, we launched, uh, we were the first manufacturer to launch EVs on mass into any market. So we launched into Norway. And at that time, we launched into three countries, Israel, Ireland, and Norway. So they were the first three countries, basically in the world where mass EVs were launched. Uh, so I was involved in setting up the dealer network and that for the EVs. I mean, that's, that's very interesting for us, uh, John, because in fact, last week we hosted what was, we think, the world's first virtual EV conference. Uh, uh, from Bottom Sound Studios and Let's Talk Automotive. And obviously the, the purpose of that was to, I think, to, to almost convince educate. the public and educate the public yeah. on, on the virtues of, of electric vehicles. I, I must say, I'm still a little bit on the conservative side in terms of my negativity. Uh, but of interest for us, of course, is Norway yes. as a market. Uh, so I think, I think before we get into anything else, John, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you've actually seen this. I think it's a GM. It's a GM advert. It's a yeah. GM advert in, in uh, America. So before we talk about this uh, uh, more, let's just have a look at this quick advert, John, and then we'll get back to you. Did you know okay. that Norway sells way more electric cars per capita than the U.S.? Norway. <laughs> well, I won't stand for it. Never mind. With GM's new Ultium battery, we're gonna crush those losers. Crush them! Let's go, America. Keenan, Norway's out EVing us. Wait, what's this? Oh, it's my daughter's birthday. She's really into pirates lately. I don't lately. care. Grab an EV, meet me in Norway. Okay, can I say goodbye to my family? Nope. All right. Ah! Ah! Aquafina, sorry to disturb you, but Norway's beating us at EVs. Nah. -uh. Uh-huh. 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 Meet me there in an hour. Can I ride with you? No! GM's Ultium battery is made for all types of vehicles, so soon everyone can drive an EV. Oh! 
Why don't we all just go together? No, and Will is probably flying private. Hey, Norway, listen up, you fish loving. Oh, this place is adorable. Damn it. Where are you guys? We in Finland. Where are you? I'm in Norway. Norway? You're in Sweden. Oh, damn it. <laughs> I absolutely love that area. I think it's 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 brilliantly it's done. Brilliant. But John, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, the dark side of Norway because although it has one of the highest penetrations of electric vehicles, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is is that Norway is a very big oil producing nation. Yeah, it's, it's huge. I think they're one of the biggest exporters of oil. And what's interesting is. All the money they made from the oil, they've, they've invested into this fund. So they've invested, I think they've got 380 billion euros into this fund. So they don't actually spend the money. They only spend the interest off what they've generated into this fund. So this, they've built a huge amount of infrastructure. Um, so it's quite a fascinating story because they're actually quite a poor country before they discovered the oil. Okay, that's interesting. You know, obviously, one of the things that, that's on everybody's lips, particularly from a South African context, with our troubles with, with Eskom and its ability to produce electricity, um, we've heard from Toyota and, and some of the senior guys at Toyota that their concern is, is that if, if vehicles converted to being fully electric by some of the timelines that uh, some of the manufacturers have put in place, that they might not be able to keep up with the, the power supply required to run these vehicles. But you, when we were discussing this a little bit earlier, um, you brought up a very interesting point about it's, it's more, uh, more than just the potential issues with electricity supply, but some, there are some other environmental aspects to consider with electric vehicles. Maybe you can just uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I think electricity supply is very important. And in the Scandinavian countries, you get a lot of the electricity supply from hydro or from wave uh, technology or uh, through wind technology. So they get a lot of, you know, good quality, uh, environmental friendly electricity. But the other thing too is to consider is what goes into the batteries. So you're starting to see now that you're getting shortage of uh, rare earth metals and that. And there's already talk now Norway are going to start mining some of the seabeds and that for, for some of these metals. So I think we need to, I think EV is a good solution. It will be part of the solution, but I don't think it's the whole solution. The other thing is EVs. Whenever we talk about EVs, it's the talk about passenger cars. And the way they say it, you think it's all vehicles, but it doesn't cover the bigger engines. So I think we need to take that into consideration, talking EVs. Absolutely. And I, and I think also one of the biggest um, jobs, I suppose, that the motor industry has got and the executives, the marketing executives have got in their hands is to convince uh, a large proportion of the population to give up their, their internal combustion engines. And if I can just read a comment from one of our viewers, Costa, thanks Costa for posting this. And he says, most petrol motors won't die out now. They will just get smaller, which we're already seeing. I mean, yes. we're getting to small block um, motors with turbos. Maybe about 2030, uh, they'll be like completely gone, but most people will still own petrol motors. I, for one, I still have my B6S4 and my N55, N55 powered E90. And I think that's, that's going to be uh, one of the major challenges moving forward. Sure. Completely agree. I think, John, I think what I'd like to do next is to compare the South African market to the Australian market. Um, and, and one thing that we've discussed on the show before was pricing. Yeah, and, and, and this is going to be very interesting. Um, a lot of people in South Africa complain about the, the vehicle pricing um, being very expensive compared to other places. And we thought that this opportunity speaking to you today would be a nice exercise and experiment to actually, you know. Let's, let's look at the let's, relativity let's, of let's pricing. Look, yeah, let's look at what the facts are. And I think maybe we just need to throw out a caveat there to, to the viewers. Uh, this is not an intensely accurate sort of assessment because yeah. we haven't factored in too much detail in terms of on the road charges and also some of the slight spec differences that might occur between Correct. the models that we've chosen. 
But I think it gives us a good rule More of thumb and good uh, feel for where we stand as a market in South Africa. Agreed. So, John, let's kick off with the first one, which is the Toyota Yaris Ascent. Um, what do you, and, and by the way, we also need to point out that the prices are different in different states because there's different taxes applicable. But let's, let's keep it to Victoria, where you're based, John. And uh, so the Toyota Yaris Ascent, well, how much is that in Australian dollars? Yeah, that's 26,915 Australian dollars. Okay, so we did a, a little calculation earlier, and that's, that's just over 300,000 Rand. So, and that's, uh, and I'm going to talk to the fluctuation of the exchange rate and how sure. you've got to almost be psychic to predict what it's going to be in yeah. six months. But that same vehicle in South Africa, which is the 1.5 XI, is 269,500 Rand. So, uh, the, uh, on that model, quite a big difference. And the irony, of course, is that the Yaris is the most referenced vehicle by people who argue about cars being expensive in South Africa that they always say it's cheaper in Australia. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a big price difference there. All right, then uh, the next one we've got is the Audi Q340 TFSI Estronic S-Line. What have, what have you got it there in uh, uh, price-wise in Australia? Yeah, you know, we're looking at 66,964. So. All right. So translated roughly, that's 777,000 Rand. Fonny, yeah. viewers out there, what do you think? So we've got it in South Africa at 715,000 Rand. All right, so, so this vehicle here is cheaper in South Africa than what it's in Australia. 100%, yeah. John, um, explain to us differences when we spoke earlier. Um, you said that, you know, there's, I, I think you called it, um, Per tax, what, what taxes was it called? Well, there's different, there's on the road taxes, there's, there's Carnet, yeah. I'm not Carnet, there's um, ad valorem taxes, there's luxury taxes, etc. So, so in, in South Africa, obviously, we do the normal on the road charges and license and reg and all that sort of stuff. In Australia, what's it like? What do you guys have there that comes on top of the pricing when it comes to buying a new vehicle? So there's a couple of things. The one is the luxury car tax. So that yes, depends that on the type of car. So that's about any car over about 65, 66,000 uh, generates luxury car tax. And it's quite high. It can be up 20% of the value sure, of the sure. car. And if it's an environmentally friendly engine, 75,000. So if that makes a huge difference. And a lot of car manufacturers try and keep their prices just under that car tax level. And then we pay stamp duty. Uh, and that's also normally a fair car and then we pay a registration tax. The registration tax isn't that high. It's probably for a luxury car it will be about eight, nine hundred dollars to about a thousand dollars. So uh, but it depends just on which state you're Okay. Very so each state when, is when, different. Yeah, when you mentioned that just now, that's my my next question would be obviously you guys, like you said, have different uh, pricing structures and, and rules and regulations and laws when it comes to the different states. Um, so a vehicle might be cheaper in a different state. And, and Peter actually raised the question that could you actually then go and buy the car? Like in, in South Africa, we would go to Mpumalanga. If I live in Gauteng, I go buy the car there because it's cheaper there. Is that allowed in Australia? No, not really. They're quite strict on it. So you, you have to have your proof of residence where you're located. So if you had a business in a different state, you could probably buy through the business. Uh, so you could get around it that way. But generally, people stick to the rules. So if the government says this is a regulation of this rules, people then uh, stick to them. Uh, we probably, as South Africans, we're a little more entrepreneurial. We find ways you know, to work the rules in our favor. You know, sure. But that's not so much here in, in Australia. You know, so. so, John, I mean, that ethos, though, uh, and we were discussing this a little bit earlier, you know, the, the fact that Australians are very disciplined in, in following the rules. You know, one of the things that stands out for me is the massive difference in the death rates on our roads between South Africa and Australia. Um, and I don't know if people are aware of this, but the death toll, the annual death toll on Australian roads becomes a national crisis if it breaches 500 a year. That is insane. In South Africa, that's, our, that's half of our monthly average. Yeah. Um, so we have between 15 and 17,000 people that die. Um, would, you, would you attribute that to, to the discipline that generally exists within Australian drivers as well, John? 
Yeah, it's very much about the road rules. So if the speed limit is a certain, say, 100 kilometers an hour, everybody sticks to that speed limit, so they, they don't go off it. And if you look at, I lived in Finland for a long time, it's even less, the death toll is even less there. But because they, they, the amount they fine you is linked to the amount you earn. So if a policeman stops you, traffic officer, he can immediately see how much your income you can link to the tax office, and they fine you accordingly. So if you go 10 <laughs> kilometers over the speed limit, I think you, your starting fine will be about 2,000 euro. Oh. And then it escalates from there. Yes. So you can get a 50,000 euro fine for going 15 or 20, depending on how much you're earning. That is I mean, that would, that would be a magnificent system to work in South Africa, save for the fact that nobody declares their tax either. So <laughs> we can strike that one off. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's incredible. I mean, it just shows, you know, that uh, it can be done. I think if the authorities have the right attitude and appetites in South Africa to do the right sure. thing, instead of hiding behind bushes and taking bribes, yeah. uh, we might be able to, you know, alleviate a death toll that is almost as bad as the pandemic that we're currently suffering okay. under. I don't want to forget, though, uh, guys, that we also have one last vehicle that we're going to do a price comparison on. And I think, John, it's a, it's a good example because you spoke about the luxury tax and the severity of the luxury tax. And I think it might well be illustrated in our last model, which is the C43 AMG. So uh, what, what, what kind of price are we looking at in, in the state of Victoria for a C43 AMG? Yeah, that would be about 127397 So that would be your driveway price. Okay. So again, at a, at, at a spot rate today of 11.6 uh, Rand to the, to the dollar, that translates into 1.477 million Rand. Um, and in South Africa, that same vehicle retails for 1.297 million. Uh, yes. So it's, you can see the effect of the, of the, uh, the luxury tax there. And I think yeah. it's also noteworthy that uh, what is GST in Australia? It's far, uh, 10%, hey, eh, John? Yeah, 10%. And that's so included again, in the base price. Yeah. So same, same story with us here, obviously, except with VAT, except our VAT is 15%. So, you know, you still got to factor in another 5%. So I think, I, I think we're safe in saying that in today's terms, yeah. and I know it fluctuates, and sure. that happens sometimes when the RAND depreciates radically. But I think the message is clear for me, and that is, is that we are not being ripped off when it comes to the price of cars in South Africa. Because I think, John, another question maybe to end off this section is uh, if we just compare the market size yes, between South Africa and Australia. So typically, what do what are, what are your annual numbers look like? So annually, we do just over a million vehicles. So it'll be about 1.1 million. But this last year was down a bit with COVID. So it was 900 odd thousand. So, but I think we'll get pretty close back to that 1.1 million. Uh, we've sort of predicted that and put our peg in the sand that it'll be just over 1.1 million. Sure. Wow. I mean, that's an incredible number if you consider. I mean, the population in Australia, John, what is 25 odd million? Yeah, it's about 25 million just over that now. So. Okay, so it's, it's, it's less than half of South Africa. And uh, to put that in perspective, our best year in the last decade, I think we retailed 675,000 vehicles. And, um, but I think for the last five years, we've been averaging around about 500,000 vehicles. So we sure. neatly half of Australia's vehicle sales with more than double the population, just to put things in perspective. So it's an incredible achievement that you guys actually do in Australia from a, from a vehicle sales point of view. But the interesting point to that, I think we, our vehicle park's 19 million. Yeah, and oh, that's incredible. So that's, yeah, so that's where it's sitting at the moment. John, I've got a, I've got a viewer's comment that came in, and uh, I'll throw this one to you. Um, I'm say, it says here, I'm not sure that John is calling from Australia, so I think the viewers are actually thinking that we uh, set this up, because, it, because she says that not once have he said, mate. <laughs> Well, well, deep down, I'm still South African, so I'm, I'm getting there. Awesome, awesome. awesome. All right, John, thank you very much for joining us for, uh, for this segment of the show. But you're unfortunately not done, or fortunately for me, you're not done, because the next segment is game time. Okay, John, so I've made this pretty easy because I make the rules and uh, this game is designed for Peter to lose. 
So um, how this works is we're going to show you a partial picture of a car. If you recognize the car, please shout out your name. And I'm going to take into consideration that there's a bit of a delay to get the picture down under. Um, shout your name if you recognize the car. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a tip. And this is not going to help Peter at all. <laughs> this is the top seven selling vehicles in Australia in 2020. All right. So that should make it a little bit easier for you. All right, everybody at home, please, I see that Costa is enjoying the show tonight. Costa, play along tonight. If you uh, recognize the card, just pop your answer into the comments below. Everybody ready? Peter, you ready? Uh, always. Remember to shout your name, John. I'm going to give you all the, I'm going to give you all the points. Don't worry. Here we go. Here's the first one. Yo, oh, that's difficult. Oh, I think I know what that is, Peter. You must shout your name, John. Do you recognize that car? Top selling, the number one selling car in Australia in 2020. Well, I'd have a go to Toyota Hilux. Absolutely correct. Yes, this is going the way that it's supposed to go. <laughs> one to John and zero to Peter. Okay, so a little bit more of the same. Let's go to the second one. Well, that's easy. That's a that's, blank screen. That's, <laughs> no, that's, that's nothing. So, unfortunately, we can't see anything. There we go. Oh, There's Peter, the second Peter, 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 what is Peter. that? I, I'm going to say that's a Ford Ranger. You're, you are absolutely correct. Unfortunately, that do, is do a Do you know Ford, what gave that away? What it gave it away? Is the, the color. Because that's, that's yes. the launch color, launch color yes. for the Ranger. Absolutely. Otherwise, I would not have guessed it. So, it just shows the power of their marketing activities. Very, very interesting again, John. That's top selling. Standing out color, you know. Yeah. Oh. Two, two top selling vehicles in Australia 2020 Toyota Hilux Ford Ranger. Yeah. Very similar to South Africa's dynamics very, because, very I mean, the Hilux is, is the top selling vehicle in, in South Africa as That's well. That's it. All right. I see Marius Lange is playing along. He got Toyota Hilux. Costa got Toyota Hilux. Marius got Ford Ranger. Well done for playing along, guys. Uh, just please be quicker so that I can read and get the answers, <laughs> boys. <laughs> Okay, so John, are you ready for the third one? Here it comes. Yeah, no, ready. Anybody get that? Can I? Okay, Peter. Peter, what is that? I don't know the model, but I'm pretty sure that's an oval on the right hand side. So I'm going to say that's a Ford. No, you're wrong. Wrong. Ooh. Yeah, John, do you know what that is? John, John, can you hear me? This is it. This is it. No, John, this is a Toyota RAV4. Can you hear me? John, can you hear me? Yeah, Toyota RAV4, John, well done. <laughs> oh, where's your sense of patriotism? Well this done. This is South Africa versus he, Australia. No, he's also South African. John, well done for getting that one right. Well done. Yeah, the guys at home getting it right. Mario has got it right as well. Okay, guys, moving on to the fourth one. Oh my goodness. This is in order the top seven selling cars in Australia in 2020. Uh, John, do you know what that you, is? You've stumped me on this one. Fritzy, come on, can't you expand it a little bit to give us a bit more of a hint? Is it also a Toyota? Yes, it is. Peter, yeah. Toyota. No, 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 no. Uh, it's a Toyota. John, do you know what this is? <laughs> It's a sedan. Toyota John. Corolla. Yes. Toyota ah. Corolla. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So the score at the moment is three to one to John. So I'm feeling very comfortable with what we're doing at the moment. You uh, realize this costs me lots of beers after the show yes, if I lose. Yes. Which is why he's always happy. There's no other motive other than the beer. All right, John. <laughs> we are um, we now going into very interesting. So so in the top in the top what was it four. Three Toyotas, Toyota Hilux, RAV4 and Corolla. Yeah. Very, very big uh, market in Australia. But now we're moving on to a little bit of a difference. So, uh, John, very, very quick on your name draw here. Here comes the fifth one. Yo, that's difficult. Is that a Hyundai? It's not John. Peter. Peter. Peter, what is that? I'm going to say that's the new Mazda CX-5. Yo, let's see that, uh, Fritz. Is that a Mazda CX-5? Absolutely correct. Yeah. Absolutely Very correct. Very good, Peter. You're too quick. 
<laughs> okay, so the score is 3-2. to two. Uh, John's still in the lead going into number six. The guys at home are... Uh, Costa says he's trying. <laughs> he's, trying. <laughs> he's trying. Well done, Costa. Okay, here comes number six, guys. John, you just said this. Hyundai. Hyundai. I thought you. Oh, Hyundai. Yes. I <laughs> Yes, John. <laughs> That's like a well done. Mind you, that's actually stunning. And if, if, if you just block off the front, it, it looks very BMW 1 Series-ish. It does. Yeah, and there's awesome. a little bit of Volvo in there for me in, as well. In the front, yeah, yeah. right. That's a bit of a, it's a yeah. hybrid. Hybrid. <laughs> it's a hybrid BMW Volvo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the score at the moment is 4-2. to two, So it's all over and done with exactly the way it should be. But let's see if Peter can get the last one. Number seven on its way, John. Peter, Peter. Yo, oh. Pete, that was quick. What is this? That is, that's got to be the Mitsubishi Triton. And the only reason why I know that is because I used to work for Mitsubishi. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely correct. Absolutely. Okay, so four to three. I'm very happy. Peter feels like he almost got something right. But uh, yeah, thank you very much. Well, well done, John. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much, guys. I, I'm a bit slow there this morning, you know. But <laughs> it's, too early in the morning. It's, it's half past <laughs> three in the morning. We can totally understand. John, maybe just the last uh, final thought from your side. Uh, Australia versus South Africa, Rugby World Cup. Where did you, uh, where did you uh, see that going? Well, I, you know, I think the Springboks were... <laughs> they came out as a surprise. Because I didn't think Australia had any chance. We, were, you know, I think Australian rugby has been struggling for a long time. They yeah. don't have the depth in that in terms of, and they're competing against so many sports here, so they don't. Mm. I think it's a bit yeah. of a challenge for them. Uh, but the so, Springboks, so, so I think. Did you still support the Springboks, well. or did you did you support Australia? No, no, we always support the Springboks, uh, <laughs> and then our second side is Australia. So. Awesome. Well done. Excellent. Well, listen, John, thank you so much for joining us and thank you so much for staying up or, or getting up early for joining us. We really appreciate it. And uh, I think his, his colleague's name is Mark. Is that yeah, correct? so we're going so, to have uh, John and Mark again on the show at a later stage. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk a bit more in depth about uh, some, of the, some of the issues in the Australian market. And of course, uh, hopefully we have a quid pro quo and uh, we will be guests on their podcast, yeah. which they host in Australia as well. So we're looking forward to that. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks very much. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. So have a thanks, good evening. John. You cheers, too. Cheers, you too, man. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah. Cheers, John. Okay. All right, so let's move on to our second to last segment and into night segment on how things work. Very interesting topic. We're talking about engine braking um, and something that not a lot of people actually think about. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very excited to see this uh, segment. And guys, this is proudly brought to you by Suzuki Auto South Africa. Welcome to Let's Talk Automotive and in this week's episode on how things work, we're going to be having a look at engine braking. So why do we do engine braking, how does it work and can it cause any damage to our vehicles? So let's have a look at the three main ways that we achieve engine braking and for those of you that don't understand what engine braking is, it's simply when we come off the accelerator, the engine itself provides some semblance of brake force that translates through to our wheels and slows our vehicle down. So let's start off with a petrol engine and how we achieve engine braking with a petrol engine. Now on the intake side, we have a butterfly valve and what we wanna do is close the butterfly valve when we take our foot off the accelerator. And what that does is, is that when the piston moves down, it creates this vacuum inside the cylinder. And that vacuum actually restricts the motion of the piston, and that's how we slow down the movement of the piston and create the engine braking effect. Now, in a diesel engine, we don't have a throttle body, really, on the intake side, so we don't have a butterfly valve here. In fact, we find the butterfly valve on the exhaust side. Now, what we want to do with this butterfly valve is open it. Unlike on this side where we close it, on the diesel we open it. And the reason why we do that is because one of the ways that a diesel gets energy into its piston 
is when the piston moves up and creates compression, that compression has a spring effect which pushes back down on the piston. So by opening up the butterfly valve, we relieve the pressure in the cylinder and now there's not as much of a spring effect for this piston and that assists the diesel engine in slowing down and developing our braking effect. Now the main reason why we have engine braking is actually for our heavy commercial vehicles. You can imagine a vehicle that weighs 50 tons fully loaded puts in a tremendous amount of heat through its braking system. So we want to actually use the brakes as little as possible to protect them and to enable them to last as long as possible. And the way we do that is with a system called a Jake brake. Now very similar to this concept of opening up the butterfly valve, what the Jake brake does is with hydraulic actuation actually opens up the exhaust valves simultaneously on multiple cylinders to allow this pressure to escape out the cylinder and therefore creating the same effect that we discussed up here just on a much more accurate scale and in fact on our commercial vehicles we have a lever that we can adjust the sensitivity of the jake brake effect so if we just want a light effect and just slow down a little bit we set it to let's say level one and if we want a higher degree of brake effort we set it to let's say setting four and one thing that you might not realize is that a commercial vehicle using the jake brake system effectively can actually extend the lifespan of its brakes to up to 500,000 kilometers. So that's quite an incredible system. Now, as I've said, it's quite safe for us to use this on our passenger cars, and we can also save a little bit on our brakes. Are there any dangers? Well, I suppose if we have a look at a manual configuration, if we change down too aggressively, we might put ourselves in a gear selection whereby when we release the clutch, our revs climb up too much and we can actually over rev the engine and cause serious damage. The only other area that I'd be a little bit concerned about is what happens to the dynamics of the vehicle when we downshift aggressively. So what we see on motorbikes and on sports cars is the vehicle's ability to blip the revs when we change down. And the reason why we do that is to in fact remove the effects of engine braking so that we don't affect the dynamics of the vehicles. So to give an example, one way that a front wheel drive car can actually oversteer is with a phenomenon called liftoff oversteer. And what happens here is that as a driver approaches a corner aggressively and they change down aggressively and they let go of the clutch, the weight transfer goes to the front wheels which takes away traction from the back wheels. So as you turn in, the back is now lost traction and we suffer from oversteer. So in a straight line and to save your brakes in general driving conditions, absolutely no problem with engine braking. But if you are doing a bit more advanced driving and you need those dynamics to be correct, I'd avoid the engine braking. So that's a brief summary on how engine braking works and some of its applications. And in fact, you might have actually heard the jake brake in action on a commercial vehicle because it sounds just like a jackhammer going off. So as the driver applies the jake brake effect, you hear this sound as the driver is slowing down the vehicle. And it's for that very reason that the jake brake has actually been banned in a couple of territories around the world, including Europe and the US, because it does make one heck of a noise which seems to wake up people in the middle of the night. Now, although they have applied some suppression to that noise in the exhaust systems, unfortunately, the truck drivers do like the sound of it, so they take out that muffling effect and carry on as usual. So that's it from this week's episode on how things work, and we look forward to catching up with you next week. <laughs> so thank you very much to the guys at Suzuki Auto South Africa for sponsoring that segment. But I'd just like to ask Peter again, quickly, what does the Jake break sound like again? It sounds just like you when you first woke <laughs> up in the morning, mate. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm going to actually save that little clip and save it as my ringtone from now on. <laughs> Do it again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Peter, um, now it's time for probably 
the highlight of tonight, and we're going to show <laughs> some of the some of the guys in in America this time. Um, uh, you are going to do 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 do, and this is Tapper of the Week. So two Corvettes, new versus old. What could go wrong here? Possibly. <laughs> oh, there's a lot. Uh, what, you see what pr he? the problem was? Is this little corner here? Yeah. Was he trying to turn? He, he was trying oh, to turn. Oh my word! <laughs> I mean, you know what the irony is of this whole thing here is it actually illustrates two things. Yeah. We we, we mostly think that uh, American cars have a, a problem in corners, which yes. the car on the right hand side illustrated. Yes. Um, but it appears that they also have a problem going in a straight line. You see, this is this this little little bit of a bend to the left here is what threw this oak off. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Completely loses it. And the beauty of this was that not only did he wreck his own car, but also the oak on the left. Well look, there is a silver lining in this cloud for you, and that is, is that both cars were the same colour. Yes. So I think they just swapped paint and drove away. <laughs> so that brings us to the end of tonight's show, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. The guys uh, online, Costa and Marius and Nadia and Leandra and everybody, let's see who else was online here. Um, who else was online here? Carmen was watching with us. Everybody joining us online, thank you very much. That is why we do this. It's an online and interactive talk show so that you guys can be part of it. Next week, we have the launch of the E-Class. The E-Class family? The E-Class family. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yes, that was amazing. Mm. So join us for that. Uh, some interesting guests coming up in the next couple of weeks. On the 25th of uh, March, Peach van Pletsen is joining us, guys. Oh, it can not wait me. It can not wait me because you're talking mingles. Uh, that's my language. That's it's, your language. I am completely bilingual. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, guys. And uh, we'll be back here same time, same place next week. Have a good one. Cheers, everyone. <laughs>